Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's MBS webinar, How MBS Can Help You in 2023. So the webinar is probably going to last a little bit under uh, 50 minutes. Everyone's microphones are muted. And as always with the MBS webinars, please give us as much feedback, ask as many questions as you want using the chat feature. As soon as uh, the webinar ends, we, we, we relook at the feedback and uh, answer all of the questions. So my name is Stephen Hamill. I'm Innovation Director at MPS. Worked at MPS for over 20 years. And now, if you'd like to reach out on social media, find me on Twitter, find me on LinkedIn. Today's webinar is going to look at uh, sort of five, five different things. We're going to start by looking uh, at how to develop robust specifications. Then we'll have a look at specifying construction products digital collaboration, so how teams can work together in the clouds, a digital coordination, so how you can connect project information together. And then finally, we'll have a little look at some of the, the, the new, new developments on the way in 2023. And I'll try and position the webinar, so it's quite fast paced, but something for, for, for everyone. So whether you're an architect, an engineer, a manufacturer, whether you've you're not actually an MBS user yet, you want to know more about MBS, or whether you've been using MBS for a number of years and so sort of just, just want to sort of remind you of the features to get the, the best out of it in 2023. So let's jump straight in. It's mainly going to be live uh, software demos today, and we'll start with uh, developing robust specifications. So we're going to jump uh, straight into MBS cores here. And uh, when you log into MBS Cores, you see your project's dashboard, and then each project uh, can have specification and prelims uh, inside it. So let's just jump into this uh, fictitious project here, the Newtown Office Refurbishment. And you'll see in terms of setting up this project, uh, I've created three sort of technical specifications using the different sort of UK libraries. And we just go through those one by one. So we will start with a core specification and then a core specification for small, small works projects, projects of simple nature. And then finally, we'll have a look at the Uniclass specification and some of the differences you get there in structure when you go for alternative classification systems. So cores is a, a sort of traditional structure that's been used sort of for over 20 years in the UK. And to add an MBS template, to the specification, you do a, a search, so searching there uh, for, for tiling. And then what you can do is uh, click on the different MBS templates here. So for example, M4, you can read the guidance on the right-hand side. And then if the right, that's the right template to add to your uh, project, you just click the button and that uh, drops into your job. A recent improvement from MBS is the is the sort of tree view for each section. So in addition to sort of seeing that sort of top level work section name, you can come in and see like what clauses exist in that section. And you can do that before you open the section or use it as a means of navigation for like when you're in the section uh, itself. And you can see there that you've got uh, a number of different uh, clauses and as you click on the clauses, uh, you get synchronized guidance on the right hand side, written by our technical authors here at MBS and links to uh, standards and other industry uh, publications. When you complete the specification, if you don't want to specify any of these technical characteristics, you can sort of park them away. And where you see the drop down value on the right hand side, you can come and uh, pick from pre written sort of typical values from. Uh, written by our uh, technical team. The idea of parking things away also uh, works at a clause level. So if there wasn't any existing concrete reads, you can click the P button and that parks the clause away. Uh, equally, when you have a clause that you're happy with, you can come and click the tick button and that marks the, the clause is complete. And you get an order trail of who was the last uh, person to edit the specification. So remove the specs that aren't relevant. Uh, and 
tick when you're happy with the close. A little bit of quality assurance, if you tick a close uh, <clears throat> that isn't complete, you get a little warning. So you see there's a little item there that I haven't uh, completed. So I'll come in now and uh, uh, you can complete that clause. I save it. And then I click the button to complete that. And you see the little pie there. I've made decisions either completed or parked away clauses on four of the 64 clauses in this section. So that's the sort of basic principles of uh, putting together a specification uh, using the cause, the common arrangement of work section and library. The cost effective, uh, the more cost effective version of cause for small, sort of more simple projects is our small works library. <clears throat> and that covers so similar things, um, maybe not some of the more complex things like curtain walling or green roofing or what have you, but it covers it in sort of less detail. So if I search for tiling again, but this time uh, just show the small works library, I still find M40, but what you'll see is that the guidance is, uh, is much less. It's meant for some more simple jobs. And the, the clauses, uh, there's not as many clauses and they don't go into as much, as much depth. So imagine doing a new build house, house extension, loft conversion, uh, the content, uh, just what's needed for that sort of job, but sort of big complex commercial jobs is probably the main, main cause library that's, that's needed. In terms of software functionality, it's exactly, exactly the same. You can go for the chorus, a basic version, or a chorus pro. But yeah, coming through there now, modern things is complete, removing things. But you see there's about 20 clauses, where I think in the full cause library, there was maybe a 60, 60 clauses. And then for the third content set for the UK, it's the, the, the unit class structured, the unit class developed for some more BIM projects, digital projects. And just to uh, show one or two of the differences here, like the main one is it's meant, instead of a, a big checklist of clauses in a work section, it, it's a sort of systems grid based approach with this sort of wizard clause at the top. So basic principles are the same. You search for the template you want. You get guidance on the right hand side. You click the plus button to add it to the job. <clears throat> but the, the big sort of obvious immediate uh, difference is you only get one clause, which, which could look a bit strange at first. But every single one of these selections is like a checklist which brings in the relevant clauses for your job. So for example, internal wall tiling systems, what sort of tiles would you like? As I come in here, there's your checklist. So whereas in cause, you'd maybe remove seven of those, leave two of them in. Here you can come through, uh, pick the clause that you'd like, and that's going to then add that into the job. So you've got a nice sort of checklist of all the different products, which in cause would be across different sections. And then you create the relationship between the system, such as a wall tiling system, and the tile or the adhesives, or the reinforcement uh, that that system is made of. And that relationship continues, but you can go from system or product down to things like the execution clauses. So it's a bit of a sort of richer data model. And it means that, they, that there's a sort of single home for, for each each product, each requirement that can be referenced from different systems. So you can see on this particular tree view, as I build up the project spec, I go from the tiling system uh, to the product, <coughs> to the execution requirement. Now at this sort of point in the demonstration about how to get the best out of specifications, over the last two or three years, there's been lots of uh, requests in that's fine in theory. Show me some real examples, like a, a, as if it was a, for a full project. So what we did last year, working with the external consultant spec studio, who've worked on huge projects across the world, is uh, we work with them to create some sample specifications, which are free uh, to download. 
So what we've got is a full architectural specification, uniclass format and cause format, so you can see what it looks like sort of when it's when when a project specification is finished using their sort of best practice uh, sort of uh, specification writing rules. So here's a full set of cause specifications for a, a fictitious sort of restaurant building. If I go to uh, M40 again, you'll see that all of the decisions for that particular project have been made. So uh, yeah, it is, it's all uh, complete. And as you go through, uh, you can see sort of individual products have been specified uh, all the way down to just put the tree view up a nice way of sort of navigating this. So all the different tiles down to things like the the, the, the fixing requirements, preparation, uh, movement joints, uh, etc. One thing on the difference between cores and uniclass, and if you download these specifications, it's it's an interesting one to 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 have a look at. But if you look at the top, what Spec Studio did is sort of manually create the relationships between the relevant sections. So for something like a, a internal stone tiling system, to specify in cores, you need to include M40, but also M10 for the screens, Z20 for adhesive, Z21 for mortar, Z22 for sealants. And then you also have to cross-reference the, the relationship between products. So you can see the manual cross-references to clause a 651 here for the uh, movement uh, adhesives and 825 for the movement joints. So there's a there's a bit of that sort of manual coordination between the information and the specification, which can be hard to manage. In the Uniclass specifications, that's all done with the, the systems, the products, the execution, a linkage which the software manages. So if I go and find the, the tiling system here. Uh, it's like the whole tiling system. You've got the relationship between the system down to the products, down to the execution uh, clause once it's complete. So wall ties, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one thing just to mention here is it's possible to specify something once, but referencing it from a number of products or a number of systems. And um, no, I'm doing an architectural example here, but it's equally important in engineering. Like you could have one specification for copper pipes or steel pipes and then reference it from a number of parent systems that use uh, that type of pipe work. So here, for example, for the architectural example, the requirement around applying adhesives has been invoked by the, the floor covering system, the internal wall system, uh, 301 and, uh, sorry, 303 and 302. So I'm in the specification for internal walls, but if I click this here, I'm jumping to the specification for the floor covering system. And you'll see that the, the requirements there are, are sort of shared, whether it's tiles on the wall, tiles on the floor, the requirement is written once and shared by a number of, a number of clauses there. And in terms of publishing, all of this rich information can, can be published in the sort of PDFs. And uh, these are what are available to download from the MBS website. But inside the software, there's a record of all of the PDFs that I've, I've issued. So I've done sort of like through the timeline, early stage specification, that's just got system descriptions, then the initial draft. And then finally I've published a full, and get the PDF there, a full specification with all the systems in. And then in addition to that, I've, I've grouped it by packages as if I'm working for a main contractor and they've asked me to put it into the, the different packages, like all of the floor coverings together, all the decks together, the shading. And then that was individual packages. If you're going to track that through the project timeline, through the construction with revisions, et cetera. So you don't have to issue the full spec every time. You could say just issue the revisions to the for the rest system or the window systems. So we have a look at one of those uh, specifications that it looks like when you publish it. Uh, you make it look nice and professional. You can put that metadata on the front page. 
uh, the company logos here, Spec Studio wrote the spec. And a few years ago now, it was HOK that did the, the design of the, the fictitious restaurant working uh, with MBS. You can put hyperlinks on the cover page, and then you get a nice table of content. So you can see there's six or seven systems within that sort of package specification. And then inside the specification, you've got your internal links down the PDF, you've got your external links to things like bed manufacturing names. And you can also link to commentator environments. For example, if you want the subcontractor to, to get part of the prelims or you've got a folder there with all of the, the drawings on. And what we've done here is, a, I know it's not a proper commentator environment, but we've got a public Google Drive where you can actually download the, like some of the example drawings as well. So the, the, this one here has been uh, generated from a model environment, but you can see that the specification, the, the model's information, uh, the, the, the scheduled information all being coordinated in the same, all PDF'd. And that, that's coming from the rich database. This is a sort of formal issue uh, from MBS. Uh, it's worth while saying that both in the code specs and the unit class specs, in addition to the classification codes, because you might have two or three different mirrors, you might have two or three different wash basins. We use the, the code suffix and prefixes to give a little sort of project unique code as well. And that fits in quite nicely when you're so just trying to find things. So in the specification, I can look at systems or products. I can look at everything that's in there. But equally, I can just now just put like SAN hyphen and I'll see all of the SAN everywhere as systems and products just by having a little look at it. See one of these countertop wash basin. Just drop that into the suffix there. So you've got classification, suffix, title, you can use them for whatever you want to package code or say like two more washrooms or what have you. But it just gives you greater flexibility when it comes to that cross-referencing that we look at, that we look at later. Exactly the same principles on the course spec as well. We jump into the course spec here. Uh, and you can see that inside uh, the summary appliances here, you've got the little prefixes and suffixes used as well whether it's course, whether it's unit class. If you want to download these, by all means, put a comment in and we'll get uh, back to you, but you can just go to the website now. So come to the mbs.com, go to resources and come across the sample specifications. And all you've got to do is uh, click the download and you'll get a zip file that contains all of the unit class specs and all of the, the core specifications. I realize this is just a quick sort of 10 minutes overview. If you'd like to, to have sort of full 45 minutes listening to Specs Studio as well, it's this, this link on the left hand side. So we've got a sort of full 45 minute, 50 minute webinar that really does a bit of a deeper dive on that specification development. Really well attended. We've got thousands plus people attending this webinar. The big feedback at the end is of tell us more about the cause, the common range of work section content as well. And uh, you can get that from this link here. So a follow-up article looking at cause. So the webinar is about the basic principles in unit class. And then we just sort of got a bit of a sort of technical article here looking at some of the, the, the differences because we know about half of the MPS user base use cause, half use unit class. So we want to provide support for, uh, for both ways of working. So that concludes the first section on specification. Now we'll have a little look at specifying uh, construction products. Okay, so just starting on the MBS website, you'll see that the, the, the two major platforms from MBS are Chorus and Source. Uh, to get the source, Google it. Oh, there's a little button here, go to MBS Source. Source is a collection of hundreds of thousands of products and variants. Uh, from 1,100, nearly 1,200 now, uh, manufacturers. Manufacturers that serve a uh, UK uh, construction industry. And I guess the, the key premise is, instead of specifiers having to go to 
like potentially 1200 different websites and see information in different structures and different places, we can work with these manufacturers to put everything in a sort of standardized format so you can go to a single place and get the information at your fingertips. And we put a huge amount of effort into MBS Source over the last two or three years. And one thing we did right at the start is we worked with industry to, to, to find out what information is needed by specifiers from construction product manufacturers and also what information should like best practice should be provided. And one thing we did, we worked with uh, the Construction Products Association in about 2019 to do like, a really big survey of specifiers, finding out like, what they wanted from manufacturers. And we searched for like CP and NBS, or drop something in the chat, we can, we can send you that. And one thing that CPA did in response was bring out a sort of code for manufacturers to say, look, best practice, this is what you should be providing for specifiers. And uh, one thing we did at MPS was do a little white paper looking at that code. You can drop the, you can download that uh, from this URL. But just having a little look, it sort of summarizes the code and gives a bit of an MPS commentary on it. There was like 11 clauses in here. Things like providing technical contact, contact information, uh, classifying products uh, correctly, providing third party certification, providing technical characteristics aligned to the relevant standard, uh, supporting information like installation manuals, all just really good common sense recommendations for manufacturers uh, in terms of how they put information on their own websites, what they put in their product data sheets. Uh, and if they uh, partner with companies like NBS, what information they should uh, just sort of uh, push to the industry. So I want to show some uh, specific examples of what we've done in terms of standardizing the way that we work with manufacturer partners to present uh, these, these to, to the industry. So let's just pick a, what a manufacturer. If I look here, just spend a little bit of time preparing for this, just looking at some sort of good, good examples. But for every manufacturer, you, you get that same sort of homepage. So you get, uh, first of all, contact information. So straight away, you can contact the, the, the manufacturer, there's a telephone number, their website, the ability to contact them, and also sort of specific sort of technical contents, sales contents, et cetera, as well. And then we have a number of tabs, third-party certification products, case studies, uh, literature, et cetera. And that's the same for all manufacturers. So whichever manufacturer you want to find information about, instead of going to 1,200 different websites, you put go to one source of information and see everything in a sort of standard uh, format. Now, when we did research, it's, it's the technical product information that's most important to specifiers. Let's just uh, jump back to the manufacturer Lorient here and look at the products that they've got here. You get filters on the left-hand side. So you can see, you can uh, go down and see what sort of type of product you want, but I'll, I'll just jump on the, the first product here. Actually, before I've got the first product, one of the key things is, okay, these are my technical characteristics, but this is my third party certification. And yeah, I think you saw there, like, things like certifier, secured by design. If I go to this particular smoke and fire door seal, you can see like, quite near the top, we have sort of listed their third party certificate certification. We've got things like EPA, things like certifier. Uh, and I can jump down there and actually look at the certificates themselves. And we try and model the information around the certificates. So not only does this product have a certified certificate, but it was first issued in 2004. It was last issued in 2019 and has an expiry date of the following. And then you can come and download it and take a copy for a project box or, or what have you. So uh, certification, a uh, big important thing, right near the top of the page. Uh, classification, so this is classified as door and window, weather strips and seals. That's uniclass, but without having the big long codes, et cetera. And that allows us to group products from different manufacturers together. So here's 
a number of manufacturers, 55 products that all do door and window weather strips and seals. So if I drop down there, you, you have Lorient, but you also have Ephesus, the house brand, the stop, uh, et cetera. So they're all there and you can do product comparison, uh, et cetera. Working down the page, the ability to get like a technical content information is there at any point. And uh, the manufacturer's there to answer any queries. This little button here gives a little URL, which is permanent. So it's just a short URL that you might want to include in the email or an Excel file or inside a 3D, 3D object or what have you. But that will always resolve to that same uh, information from that manufacturer at that point in time. And it was being replaced by a different product. We've done this for years at MPS in terms of standards through our work with construction information service. But that, that, that's the end. at that point in time, this is what the manufacturer was publishing. And it's a nice little short code, very quickly copy to the clipboard. So in terms of the, the, the CCPI recommendations around version control and sign off, now that's a record of what went out. And then this is something new that we did last year. And a lot of our specifiers was like, how can we trust this information? It could, is it three years old, five years old, seven years old? Is this product still available? But we brought in this sort of like traffic light system to say, you know, when was this information last modified? And more importantly, when was it last verified by the manufacturer as current? So you can hover over there and see that the manufacturers so I'll confirm this is current on the 12th of December. And there's a little sort of color indicator, and we could change this over time, but if it's in the last six months, it gets a little green dot, amber, if it's between six and 12. Once it's gone over 12 months, and we talk to our manufacturer partners, we, we push email notifications to them and say, look, can you check this information and just say, you don't want to specify a product which is no longer available or that has the wrong technical information because it's uh, changed. It would encourage people that use source to like, sort of self-police this a little bit as well. So if there's a product that you want uh, and it is sort of turning the red, drop the manufacturer an email and just say, look, is this still available, uh, et cetera. Coming down the page here, this guidance on application. So what is this product like designed to be suitable for? Where shouldn't you use it? Is always there for every product, whether it's cladding or piping or uh, smoke seals. Then you sort of come down into the uh, classification, primarily uniclass, but also where you'd maybe specify in cores, quite a lot of uh, locations there in cores. And then coming down to the technical characteristics uh, as defined in the, the relevant standards. So that's the sort of like, basics of source and what the what the, the sort of page structure is, uh, any literature as well, like installation manuals, again, CCPI recommendations, that it's not just about like, what the product can do, but like, can you link to the installation manuals, the ONM manuals, uh, et cetera, as well. So we've provo provided this platform to, to allow manufacturers to, to put their information in the sort of format the specifiers need and then fill it with connected data. You might not know which product you want from which manufacturer. So you can do research here as well. So if I search for uh, cavity wall, I can come down and click on the Uniclass classifications. If I know exactly what it's called in Uniclass with the sort of IntelliSense, or you can just do a, a free text search. So I'm searching for cavity wall insulation. And then what you can do is from that free text search, do the uh, Uniclass sort of filter. So I know I want cavity wall insulation and I'd like mineral wool slab. And what that's doing is bringing back uh, mineral wool slab insulation that's suitable for cavity walls from uh, six or seven manufacturers there. Rock canal, Sangovan insulation, rock wool, uh, et cetera. You can use the filters on the left hand side and you can see that 33 of the 30-year products have been verified by the manufacturer in the last uh, six months. And this is where the connection with MBS course. I think if you demonstrate this for the first time, people say, okay, does this align with the specification? If I go to mineral wool uh, slab insulation in course, 
let's just jump across. I'm going to see those same products. So I'm going to put the unit class specification, but it could be course as well. I'm going to run, uh, spelled it wrong, will it find it? Yes, it will. So there's minimal rule. Now, slab insulation. Uh, there's the relationship between products and systems down there. And if I add that to the job, there's my sort of generic specification template for mineral wool slab insulation. And as I come into the clause here, uh, the manufacturer content, it's the same manufacturers that you saw uh, in MBS source. A few more here in course because obviously I did the free text a search, a, a search early, earlier, which sort of reduced the, the, the insulation to just insulation for cavity walls. But they're the same manufacturers that you see in source. They're the same products that you see in source. And there's that uh, a source logo there as well. So let's just toggle between uh, the two. Uh, let's go for a Rockwell product. And we'll go for the Nyrock cavity slab 032. And this is actually, I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here, but the variance is quite interesting. So this comes in different thicknesses. And why that's important is the technical properties may change between the 100 millimeter thick and the 200 millimeter thick. And the nicest way to sort of compare the variance is just to click this button here. And when you click that, you can compare three of the variants and see what changes. So let's compare the 150 with the 100 with the 200 mil. And as I come down here, a lot of it's exactly the same. It's got the same fire performance, it's got the same edges. But as you come down to thermal resistance, you see, you get sort of twice the performance, probably like unsurprising from the 200 mil. So it's the same product, but sort of different sizes. And it's quite a nice way that we, uh, we, we, we model this. So that's the cavity slab 032 from uh, Rockwell. You can do the same thing sort of uh, over here in cores. So I've got my specification for mineral wool slab insulation. There's the Nyrock cavity slab. And there's a number of ways that you can uh, specify that. So there's the big button, add the spec, it's going to drop it in. You could come through and then click Rockwell and then uh, the product from the drop downs. Actually, let's just demonstrate this one. Click the plus button and that's dropped straight. Uh, in the specification. Uh, one of the nice ways though is if you've done your research in source, <clears throat> it's just sort of added to the clipboard. So look, I've added to the clipboard, go to chorus, paste it in. And it's just a sort of click in here and control uh, V. And that's uh, dropping the specification from source uh, straight into the, the specification. Do research in source, nice big screen. And then you can copy and paste it uh, straight in. And you've got all of the, 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 same, the same data, just on a sort of thin screen uh, here from the, from the manufacturer. It's worth saying also that we've aligned the technical characteristics. So maybe go to a different manufacturer. Uh, let's go to the rock silk from canal for insulation. If we look at the technical characteristics here, standard thickness, spaces, edges, density, these are the technical characteristics that our technical authors have researched from the relevant standards. And then we work with the manufacturer to make sure that their technical content aligns to that sort of central, sort of generic template from MBS. That allows you to compare content from different manufacturers. And it, it's hopefully just saving time and improving accuracy uh, across the industry by having 1,200 manufacturers all in that same sort of single platform. Uh, one thing I'd quite like to demonstrate in terms of third-party certification is something we've seen as a real trend last year, and that is environmental product declarations. It's like, like rapidly becoming almost the, 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 the sort of most common type of third party certification. I think we're seeing that. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's things like, like the, the London, London plan where embodied carbon calculations are now required. Clients in terms of their ESG, like developers, have got to declare their sort of sustainability credentials. If they're on the stock markets, I think there's European regulation coming in 
on that as, as, as well. So any company that operates in the EU. So manufacturers more and more and more are uh, now pushing their environmental product declarations into, uh, into source. And quite a few focus groups on this and specifiers uh, starting to demand this information as well. So you're, see, you're now seeing this take quite a lot in source and so it's a priority for us uh, this year. Uh, another manufacturer, I think, when I was having a look beforehand, uh, told them all, so I think sort of concrete and stone uh, products, which again, people are asking, uh, tell us your, your environmental credentials. You can come there and see which of their products have the sort of EPD certificates and drop down. And what we're going to do, maybe talk about this a little bit later, is sort of standardize this better inside of source. So we're really working with some of the numerics, some of the values that are inside the EPDs and things like the where, where the products manufactured, what's the recycle content, what's the embodied carbon. And just to show where we're going with this, because we've started on the journey, but we realize we need to maybe make it that little bit better. If I search for sort of pile carpet tiles, do you have products from uh, lots of manufacturers, probably about 11, 12 manufacturers. Like one thing that we haven't done perfectly yet that we're, uh, that we're going to address this year is you can see we've got two different EPDs there, depending on whether I think it like, might be issued from uh, BRE and the other one I think is issued by GPU or, uh, or somebody. But we're going to align that to create, like this is the type of certificate, it's an EPD, and then secondary information. Who was the... Uh, publisher of that, but you can go across manufacturers and uh, say just showing manufacturers with uh, EPD certificates. And then another thing we're going to improve on as well is the numeric values inside there. So for things like recycled content and body carbon, it's a little bit, uh, it could be better. Uh, so we're going to sort of have ranges for this and clearly say this is A1 to A3 as defined in body carbon in the EPD and be clear on the units so that you can really drill down, say across these 330 products, I'm looking for something that's less than one about 10 kilograms per meter squared as defined in the EPD and uh, really start to work nicely with these sort of metrics. So that's a big, big focus for us. And uh, so many things like what's the country of origin, et cetera, uh, as well. So that concludes the, the, the second part of the presentation on wealth structure product information. We're now going to jump into digital collaboration. So to do this, we're going to look at MDS course and just talk a little bit more about that Lakeside restaurant project. So if I come into here, uh, these were the specifications that were developed. And what we did, we used the, the collaboration feature here to, to work side by side with, uh, with, with manufacturers. So uh, there's this external consultant, Spec Studio, and then there's also colleagues from MDS, and then there's also manufacturers. Now, when we invited these manufacturers into the project, like door tech, who were going to be specified for the, the doors, what you can do as an administrator is have a tight control over that, what that person can do. So here, for example, uh, technical contact from door tech they've only got read permission to the unit class specification. So a collaboration is not like a free for all and everyone can come in and change things in the specification. It's about saying, have a look at this. This is the live version. You can make comments uh, only, but you can't see the following uh, spec, et cetera. So just to demonstrate that my, my colleague here, uh, let's open the right window. Uh, Kate is invited to the Lakeside restaurant but she only has, uh, so there's Kate, a logged in uh, to MBS course, only has permissions to the architectural spec. So she's not seeing the core spec or the prelims, and she's only got read-only permissions. So Kate can come here and see the specification that's being developed. She can see what's in progress and how complete it is. But when she comes into one of these specifications, she can't modify it. But she can come in and add notes on the right hand side. So uh, 
uh, hopefully this is a sort of really useful feature whether you're working with colleagues writing the specification whether you've got external consultants maybe you're working with engineers architects or whether you're bringing in things like fire consultants external consultants or you'll work with manufacturers to get the specification right you can invite them into course give them read-only access and uh and let them add notes to the right hand side you know it's really interesting doing that as an exercise so if i just jump across to the spec notes for this lake like restaurants uh like working with these external uh, manufacturers they're technical experts you can see comments coming in against the door set systems from from door tech i go to another example uh, the, the, the wall lining systems from from b plus there and then uh, finally here it's a ppg pins you put the notes in those notes go there against the right system you can have a little reply thread uh, as well there so that's sort of collaboration at a project at uh, team level uh, is there like a lot of the work here was done with manufacturers but we also develop the specifications where it was and what would maybe call a, a descriptive specification so this is all in the, the sample specs if you want to download them but for example here this particular door set it seems going to be descriptive information where the design team provides a brief for the specialist subcontractor so in this specification the manufacturers going to be submit proposals by the, the subcontractor and they're sort of the requirements in terms of things like acoustic, mechanical, security, etc. There's, there's lots of different scenarios that could be used. You could be working for a client uh, early on in the project, prior to the contractor coming on board doing those requirements. Uh, you could be doing technical design, but you've left it as a sort of specialist subcontractor design portion. Or you could just be working with a manufacturer wanting their advice on the best uh, products that come together to give you the system performance that you like. But the MDS specification templates has performance content in there, in addition to the, the manufacturer products that we've seen earlier. Now, working together in collaboration, you can go even uh, further. So let's just jump back in where I'm in as an editor. You can actually copy specifications between organizations. And there's lots of manufacturers that offer that now. So what I'm going to do here is I've been invited to the Bowder, the roof manufacturer's uh, version of course. So I can come in here, read only. And Bowder prepared a specification here for myself. And this one's course format. And you can work them on Teams or what have you. Make sure the specifications are the right format. I'm doing this in Bowder's area, so I haven't even invited them into the project. You've got that choice which way you do it. But once that specification is correct, instead of working the old way where you just receive a PDF or a Microsoft Word document, you can have that prepared in NBS format. And then you just copy that to the clipboard. So collaborating with the manufacturer, their technical support team. That gets copied to the clipboard, that J41. And then I toggle back to my organization. So I come back to Tech Solutions. When I come back into the tech solutions, I come with a course that I did earlier and just click paste. And that's going to paste the specification that's been prepared by the manufacturer's technical team and drop it uh, straight into my specification there. And then I'd probably come in and double check it because I'm the one sort of signing that off and issuing it. But I've worked with the manufacturer to, to get that correct in terms of which products come together for the system. Maybe any bespoke execution requirements, any uh, requirements in terms of uh, approved installers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's all about collaboration and, and course, you can do that in the cloud as opposed to emails and word files and uh, PDFs going back and forward. There's a great case study on our website and a full sort of 45 minute webinar on this. So if, if anybody wants to know more about working with manufacturers, uh, uh, Andy Leggett, their technical manager, does a, does a great webinar on this one. Uh, and there's a summary of that on our website. <laughs> it's worth saying, uh, sorry, I've always used Bowder in this example, but there's lots of manufacturers that offer this as a service. 
and that also just staying on roofing manufacturers. Uh, let's just look at AXTA. If you go to their homepage and source, this is what you want to look for. NBS core spec writing services available. And it tends to be the larger manufacturers that have technical support team. They've subscribed to course as well, so they can work with you to develop specs and then like full specifications, not just all these similar products. And you can copy and paste them uh, between organizations. I think yeah, it tends to be more popular amongst the larger manufacturers that do complex systems. So you there, for example, secret sauna fill, things like internal partitions. Uh, I know we did a case study with Rider Architecture and Planet. Uh, I think we're doing some more complex or sort of glass partitions in an office. Uh, complex. I think the very first one was, was a Tulix, I think. So if you find a manufacturer and it has this little chip, they'll work with you to develop specifications like you can copy and uh, paste back and forward. And if you're watching this as a specifier and there's manufacturers that you'd love to get into source or to offer that spec writing service, uh, drop them an email, connect them with us, and uh, we'll, we'll try and get more and more manufacturers in source. You've got that technical uh, content you need uh, at your fingertips. So now uh, moving on to digital coordination. We're going to look at uh, linking objects annotated and uh, error checking. And I'm going to demonstrate the digital coordination in Autodesk Revit with the MBS plugin. All of these principles apply to Autodesk Vector Works and Bentley. Uh, uh, very recently, end of last year, we got the plugin for as well. So we've developed the plugin once, Clear API software development kit that works with sort of your different 3D design tools. So there's the, 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 the famous, if you like, uh, Lakeside Restaurant. What I've got here on the right hand side is MBS cores inside of Revit. And I've created a relationship, a link, you can see there with a little icon between the, the 3D model and uh, the MBS specification that's uh, in the cloud. So, what you've got here is the, all the different systems that I've been demonstrating today, but like from the design environment. And it's not just linking the, the model in the spec, it's linking the objects uh, in the model. So for example, the cladding system and the products that are inside and the material layers. So you can go straight away and see the specification, edit the specification, add notes, read the guidance, look at manufacturer content from the context of your design tool. So I have a little click on a flat roof, specification for that roof, and jump straight to the spec for the plastic sheets. Uh, or what have you. So you've got those sort of big sort of layered objects like roof covers and cladding and decking, <laughs> etc. But you can also like link the objects themselves. Like when you get down to things like the Revit families, like for example, there's the specification for the mirrors. There's the specification uh, for the WC pattern. And when you link the object to the specification clause, it adds just a little bit of information inside the object itself. So if we look at that wash basin, I'll just like zoom in on it here. Inside the wash basin type object, uh, you've got a little bit of information that's been stamped in. So there's some hidden GUIDs. So even if the parameters change, it's still linked to that specification. And then you've got the classification code, the title, the suffix, and prefix. And what that allows is easy annotations. You saw the schedule earlier that was on the, the, the drawings, but that's information that's coordinated both ways. Now, what I'm going to do here is just come away from the, the countertop wash basin here, and I'm going to go to it, accessing it from sort of the ambient NPS. So what you can see here is, uh, is it three or eight? This one here. I'm going to come in deliberately change things. I could remove it completely from the specification. You get an error message or error warning in Revit. But all I'm going to do is come and just change the number. So I change it to three two five, for example. What that's going to do is push that to the the cloud, Amazon Web Service. That'll then push it back into Revit. You might have a colleague that has it open, and you see that changes here as well. Actually, just for fun, 
I do that in this like real real time. If I come here, 325, I'll change it like 327. You'll see at the point that I'm editing it, it's checked out, so no other user can change it. And as I change it to 327 here, you'll see the 325 there pretty much instantly change. Uh, that change isn't instantly made in Revit. But uh, we don't want to just change models without people sort of knowing about it. So what we do do though is bring up things as issues. So all those errors or clauses that have been removed from the spec, I no longer want countertop wash base and I want uh, pedestal or what have you. The warnings are where the objects are still connected, but the parameters no longer match. So we can see the countertop wash basin here, uh, the line block uh, basin. The parameters no longer match. I'm just going to click this button uh, here, and that's going to update the object with the MBS parameters. So that 308, as I click here, if you watch on the left hand side, just changes uh, to the, the 327. And that's going to change for every single instance that's that type, every single place in the schedule. So you can keep that design fully coordinated with the spec. Uh, you can develop the spec as you develop the design. And one thing that we released sort of uh, late last year was a sort of cost effective sort of bundle of licenses for those that want to work in Revit and access all of the MBS information, but not take out a full uh, spec writing license. So you can purchase these licenses called designer licenses. And roughly speaking, four or five licenses a designer for one writer. So that when you have the busy times and you're annotating all of the drawings, you're coordinating things. If you're not writing the spec, you don't uh, have it. Like it was one small practice in London I was talking to that has sort of one seat of MBS chorus. But they say busy times, they have five people all coming in and doing all the annotations, but they can't afford five licenses of MBS. So we brought in this designer license with limited features, making model associations, adding spec notes. So I and as a as a writer here, I'm just taking out, uh, sorry, not as a writer, as a designer here, I'm just taking out a designer license. And as I come to try and edit this, I'm being told you don't have permission to edit it, but I can still make the links. I can still read the guidance. I can still browse the manufacturer information, and I can still come in and add spec notes. So we're seeing an increasing number of practices now sort of subscribing to the specification writer licenses they need, but then topping that up. So NBS is coming more of a sort of day-to-day -day tool with all of the connected information and links to standards and product information that can sit in the, the design environment. And at any point in time, you can come and look at your users and see whether they've checked out designer seats or writer seats and see the capacity, et cetera. If you're interested more about the designer license seats, Please uh, drop a yeah, drop a note in the chat or contact us uh, at the end of the webinar. Okay, so that's uh, the end of the webinar in terms of how you can make the most of what's already in MDS. But we have some exciting plans for, for 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 this year. I just want to show and hint at one or two things that so we're, we're working on at the moment. So the first thing we want to do is. Uh, just connect more of the data together. So take the specification around just from creating sort of PDFs that get issued, but really start to see the rich information that's in specifications and different views and coordinate more of that. So one thing that we did last year was uh, create a summary schedule where any clause that gets a little tick box against it, you get a summary that goes across all of the different sections. So what we're going to do is extend this to work with more of the parameters, things like manufacturer, product reference, et cetera, and make it whole width. So you can really use this as a sort of data grid that summarizes the most important things in the specification. So we saw earlier how you can use these codes to just see what you want to see at any point in time. You be able to do that also with the sort of like manufacturer name, product reference, whether in submit proposals and just use this as a, a really nice sort of rich grid of information. But then those additional properties, things like description, manufacturer, product reference, chorus URL, extend the Revit way of working 
the AutoCAD way of working. So those parameters are synchronized as well. So when you're scheduling reference in uh, Revit, if you've got a column for manufacturer where you've got billowing block, ideal standards, submit proposals, et cetera, that can also be synchronized with the specification. So you've got specification summary schedule and a nice big screen. And your model information, the information that comes out of the model, all synchronized. So and that's an exciting development. And in the same vein, we know that practices that have been using cores for two or three years now are building up lots of projects. Like I've seen dashboards with over 400 projects in things. So we're going to develop search functionality so that you can either search within a specification or search across the specification. Show me everywhere over the last three years I've specified a particular manufacturer or a particular type of system. Build that maybe by just on education projects, et cetera. Because everyone that uses cores is building up a huge amount of rich information. And we want to put that at your fingertips so that you can see what's worked well on projects, what maybe hasn't worked well, and keep on feeding that back. Uh, through the loop. And uh, well, oh yeah, one thing that uh, I spoke to David, our product owner, before this session, he was saying, make sure you mention this and this, improving the way that revisions works. So we're not just saying this clause has changed, but almost like your word track change is this is how it's changed. It's something that's very close to being released. I'll show you on our dev server, is the ability to browse the library by tree view as well. So I'll demonstrate that quickly in three different uh, formats. But when you come to add content, so this is on our development survey, you see on the URL, you still go search for content, but you could come in and say, okay, let, let's see what heating, cooling, and refrigeration systems are in MBS. Show me the heating and cooling systems. Show me the heating systems or the heat pump systems. And it's just an alternative way to get into the content uh, that you're interested in to add to your specification. So you can see there, we've got three different types of heat pump systems. There's the guidance on what MPS says. There's maybe some of the guidance that, that your organization has. And if that's the thing that's right for your job, click the button and it drops in. So really quickly, same example in cores. Come to add content. Here's your sort of cores content tree. So you, Maybe you can do concept design. What sort of cladding covering do we have? Ah, yes, we have some curtain boarding. We have some timber weatherboarding. Click the plus button and they drop in. And I haven't talked about international much at all today, if at all, but it's worth saying that everything we do for our UK content uh, also applies internationally for our Australian users, for our North American users. So here's the Canadian specification library, which is in sort of master format structure and come down and say oh, what have you got in terms of concrete and there's the different sections with the master format you can have a little look at what are the clauses inside the section as well before you add it but that's been a long-standing request where uh, users have said we want to browse the mbs library information not just uh, search on the mbs source side i sort of went off on one earlier saying, talking about how we want to improve the quality of the structure for certification and in particular, the numeric values in terms of the sustainability information. Sustainability is gonna be a big focus for us in 2023 and we're gonna start with the sort of factual information that's in APD certificates uh, from manufacturers uh, that are already our, our customers. We also, are going to integrate all of the national BIM library inside of source, single source. So if you come to a manufacturer and they have digital objects that you want to use in your design, let's just find an example here from Belfac. Uh, currently, you've got to jump across and go to the national BIM library to get those objects. They can be fully integrated into source and will improve. Will improve the, the plugin so it's, it's part of the source experience when you're doing the design as well so all of that those resources <coughs> and we don't have BIM as like the BIM object as the primary most important thing it's around the technical information certification the guidance but just like things like installation manuals which are linked to the to the the, the manufactured product we're going to pull in those sort of digital 
uh, BIM objects as well. And the final thing for sure is just a way for manufacturers to sort of tell their stories a little bit uh, in a more visual way, in a more data structured way. But we're going to introduce what's called the inspiration area of NBS source. This is on our sort of dev preview site. But if I was invested in something like school flooring, I can search and find like lots of different stories from different manufacturers, success stories on how their products have been used. So search for school flooring. There's a case study from uh, Fogo flooring, out of grip, uh, dagger floor. And you can come in there and, and we've really designed it to be mobile friendly as well. So it's the sort of thing that uh, let's put dev tools on here that you might do on like, your mobile on the way and work or what have you, where you can just have that sort of long scroll and browse and browse through the content. So there's the story itself, there's nice big images, and then we've asked the manufacturer to, like the more people are going to read this and discover this if you tag it up. So okay, what products are featured in the case study? What floor coverings in this case? What sort of project is it? Education project, theme, styles, what sort of spaces? Each of the spaces types is a uniclass space. Again, the code's hidden away. And then who are the team that you maybe work with? Maybe put the client in or a specialist subcontractor, or the architect. Let's just go back on a big, big screen again. And you've got that sort of long scroll. You can read the case study, you can look at some of the nice sort of images, big screen. And then you can come through and just do that long scroll and okay, which I think it was four ball flown, was it which four ball products feature in this case study? Other inspirational stories from four ball flooring. Uh, featuring piled carpet tiles, other linoleum sheets, etc., and that's what you can do if you mark your data correctly. You can go from one thing to the next, and discover different things. These are all hyperlinks on the right-hand side. So if you want to see more education case studies, you click on education, and we've got the the filler there, and that's showing you just case studies for education projects. Uh, let's just take education off the theme. Well. Uh, Product categories, obvious, that's all the unit class, classifications of products, space types, all the unit class specification spaces. This one's quite nice as well. I think the sort of theme. And we've got things like sort of your RIBA plan of work strategy items like acoustic and fire and conservation and security, et cetera. But we've also gone uh, on the RIBA sustainable outcomes as well. So each of the eight RIBA sustainable outcomes, the manufacturers can, can flag. So and embodied carbon, but sustainability is much more than just embodied carbon and land use and ecology, health and well-being. A sustainable water cycle, connecting with the community. And we also, uh, I think we're popping to sort of Briam and Passive House as well, which are big sort of UK sort of themes around sustainability. So you can see here there's uh, different sort of Passive House uh, case studies here as well. And you see those easily, you can discover those easily because they've been tagged up nicely by the manufacturer. And we'll credit that with the, the particular architect that's used these products on this uh, passive house uh, project. So that concludes today's webinar. I hope you went through lots of interesting things, things you can do now with MBS, but also things that we're going to prioritize in terms of our 2023 20, developments to sort of continuous improvement to both chorus and source. If you're not an MBS Chorus user and you'd like to know more about MBS Chorus, drop us a, drop us a message. Uh, I think this webinar today is going to be predominantly watched by specifiers or text engineers. If there's manufacturers you'd like to see inside of MBS Source, like we can work with those manufacturers and get them in. So please drop us an email if there's manufacturers that you'd like inside of Source. Equally, if you're a manufacturer watching this webinar and you'd like to get the very best best out of source, uh, drop us a message on that one uh, as well. So that concludes today's webinars. Pop a message in the chat, any questions, anything you want to know, any of the websites that I've briefly shown, like the CCPI guide, the Bowder case study, uh, drop that in the chat and we can send that through. Uh, and yeah, if you're interested in specification, 
I strongly recommend download those free specifications developed with Spec Studio cores and unit class, and it's, it's just nice having a little look through them. Reminder of our email address, info at the mbs.com. Oh, one last thing I've written on my notes. We can actually give you the, the chorus specifications in chorus format. So our support team, our account managers can copy and paste either the chorus, the core specs or the unit class specs into your area. So you could have maybe a little master, which is just set up showing an example of a sort of sample specification as well. Drop us an email on that one if you'd like to have them in the sort of original chorus format as well. So thanks for your time today. Uh, hope you have a great 2023.